Sunday, May 7th, 7.45 Mountain Time, 2017. This is going to be a long video, guys and gals. So get you something to drink, put this thing on pause, get you a bowl of popcorn, come on back, sit down and relax. This is going to be a while, a long video. It's time for me to get to work. I've been a watchman for a long time, many years. And if I've done videos as long as I've been a watchman, I'd probably have 100,000 videos. I've always been intrigued by Earth and the sun and, and the moon and the oceans and, and how it all works. And today, when I saw this UV reading of 1333, I know it was time to get busy. It's time to figure out what is wrong with our planet because we all feel that something is wrong. And I've come to the conclusion of this. Earth is struggling atmospherically and it comes down to oxygen, ultraviolet light. Yes, that's probably influenced by something in space. We all kind of suspect that. Maybe a density wave, maybe a rogue uh, brown dwarf, second sun of some sort. Uh, we can't see it. I think it takes complicated math to even figure it out. But we can see signs of it on Earth. And we know that our ancient ancestors went through catastrophe after catastrophe. Because all of our ancient past is buried underground. Something happened. Otherwise, there'd be a library that's, what, a couple hundred thousand years old? Of all of our ancestors' history. But there isn't. Everything's buried underground. So that tells us right away that there's always been some sort of a silical issue with our planet. And what is it? We all want to know. Well, I think I know part of the problem. And I'm going to share that with you. You guys know I've been drawn to the UV. I just showed you the highest UV reading I've ever taken since I've been doing this for a year. A lot of you ask, what are UV rays? What is UVA, UVB, UVC? And... I'm going to try to explain it to you just as simple as I can. UVA is what um, carries the good stuff to your body that you need, vitamin D. We all get vitamin D from the sun, or at least we used to. I think nowadays there is a vitamin D deficiency, but that's a whole other topic. So we're going to stick to topic. UVA can penetrate the skin. UVB is what burns the skin at the surface. UVC never gets past the ozone. No matter how thin the ozone may be, it just doesn't make it through the atmosphere. UVB is the one that does the damage, okay? And that's what I read today, was UVB. And that's pretty much a, a simplified version of what these rays are. And what they are, they're frequencies. UVA is a certain frequency. UVB is a certain frequency. UVC is a certain frequency. Everything is frequencies if you want to get down to it. You are a unique frequency, but that's a whole other topic. Um, what is ozone? Ozone is what filters the UV, the ultraviolet light. Um, how is ozone compared to oxygen? Stick with me here. The only difference is that ozone is made up of three oxygen atoms, while the stuff we breathe molecular oxygen is made up of two atoms. That's the only difference. So ozone is a form of oxygen right up here in the atmosphere. Okay? So oxygen in the atmosphere filters UV light, breaks it down. The ozone layer is being depleted. And I think it has spots around Earth that are weaker than others. They say that the big gaping hole over the South American uh, Atlantic Ocean, that big huge anomaly that's been there for years, they say that it's all buttoned up now. All good. Well, for some reason, I don't completely believe that. If it is, I think it's scattered out now all around the Earth into weak pockets that roam the globe. That's why some days you'll see readings of UV up into the 13s, you know, in areas like today, for instance. Here's what the high was supposed to be today. Do you see that? 8.1. That's still very high. 
But at 1 o'clock, when I took that reading of 13.3, it was only supposed to be 8.1. I'm going to show you another example from Portland, or actually Beaverton, Oregon. The UV today, peak time, 1 o'clock, 6.78. That was supposed to be the high, right? Well, here's what it was. I'm going to show you. This is from Luis up in Oregon. He's got a meter just like mine. He took a reading today of the UV. Here it is. 9192939596 was his high. And there he is in the direct sunlight with the meter. That's from Oregon today. And it was only supposed to be 6.7. So you see, the UV is definitely up. It's up all over the globe, just in a different capacity. In my area, it's a little more intense. Up in Oregon, it's much higher than what it's supposed to be. But it's not quite as intense as where I'm at. Our oceans losing oxygen. And is the ocean becoming more hostile to life? Over the years, we've seen countless stories of mass fish die-offs, starfish die-offs, squid, uh, jellyfish, fish in general. How many die-offs can you, can you recall over the past 10 years? Dozens, probably into the hundreds. If the ozone is losing oxygen, do you think maybe the oceans could be losing oxygen? Could they? I'm going to read you an article here that I am so glad it's still up. It says it's out of date. And that is wonderful because you know why? This has got information that goes back to 1995. And it's got some data in here about UV, the ozone and stuff that is helpful to today. Just like if we had... A, a site that we could go to about our ancient ancestors and the times that they lived in, say, six, 7,000 years ago, and look and say, oh, okay, here's what happened. No, we have to dig everything up in the ground in pieces and do carbon dating just to kind of get close. We don't have a clue. Oh, we have clues, but we have to be, you know, archaeological detectives to try to decipher what happened back then. Well, I'm just going to go back 22 years and just use this as a, just, to, just some data from 22 years ago about the ozone, about UV, and how it, you know, has changed up to today. But scientists now know, remember this, back in 2014, I think it was, there was a massive starfish die-off up in the Pacific Northwest. And at first, you know, they called it this, uh, what was the name of it? I'm not gonna read this entire article because they ended up basically changing their minds on what actually happened to these creatures. Um, they called it a name. I'll think of it here in a minute, or I'll find it here in a minute. They gave it a name, let's put it that way, because there was thousands of starfish that washed up on the, the seas of the Pacific Northwest. Massive die-off. Now they're saying, you know, well, this is actually 2016. They're saying it's from the, the warming oceans. There's another story. I don't know if I have it here or not. Actually, I don't. But there was another story implying that those starfish died of some virus. Then they come out in 2016 and say it's from the warming oceans, which is true. But it's more than just the warming oceans. Okay. Oceans are losing oxygen and becoming more hostile to life. Low oxygen areas are expanding in deep waters, killing some certain creatures outright and changing how and where others live. It may get worse. And this is dated March of 2015. You ever notice how the ocean is blue? Okay. The sky is blue. The absence of oxygen in the ocean makes it a deeper colored blue, a darker blue. The sky, if it were to lose oxygen, let's say up in the ozone layer, what would happen? The daytime sky would get darker. With fewer particles in the atmosphere to scatter blue light, the sky would get 
a bit less blue and much more darker. And that's what would happen if oxygen were to disappear. Just for five seconds. And we know that the ozone is basically oxygen with an extra oxygen atom. Same thing. So let's go on and read this story here. Then I'm going to read you this one that goes back to uh, 1995. Actually, I'm going to start with that one first. Are the oceans losing oxygen? Here we go. A giant sunshade. The ozone layer acts like a giant sunshade, protecting plants and animals from much of sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone O3, that is because it has the extra atom, forms a layer, and it's basically a layer of oxygen, in the stratosphere, 15 to 40 kilometers above the Earth's surface. If the ozone in the atmosphere from ground level to height of, to a height of 60 kilometers could be assembled at the surface of the Earth, it would comp or comprise a layer of gas, which is oxygen, of only 3 millimeters thick. Here's a little diagram of the Earth's ozone. Global stratospheric ozone levels have declined. Keep in mind, this was back in 1995, which means that the ozone layer is changing. I personally believe it still is. Stratospheric ozone has large natural, temporal, and spatial variations up to 30%, and that may be regarded as normal. However, we now have evidence of significant thinning of the ozone layer during spring and summer. This is observed in both the northern and the southern hemispheres at middle and high latitudes. During the last 10 to 15 years, so see we're going back even farther, um, 85 to 1980, 5 to 6% in spring, or I'm sorry, Going back 10 to 15 years, the ozone layer above the northern hemisphere is reduced by 5 to 6% in, uh, in the spring per decade. The latest tests, January and March of 1995, have shown large reductions with a maximum of more than 30% reduction compared to normal. A depletion of the ozone layer will increase the UV radiation at ground level. Increased doses of UVB may cause skin cancer, eye cataracts, damage to the immune system in animals as well as human beings, and have an adverse impact on plant growth. We're seeing that. You know you are. If you're paying attention to the UV, you're well aware of that. This map up here shows UV intensity at noon calculated from sun angle and satellite measurements of the ozone layer. The model assumes clear sky conditions at sea level, and average sun reflection with increased altitude and reflection. For instance, snow conditions in mountain areas, the UV dose can be considerably higher, and that's true. The UV index used in the maps above have been developed by Environment Canada. It runs on a scale from 0 to 10, with 10 being a typical midsummer sunny day in the tropics. A relative scale ranging from low to extreme is also applied. In extreme conditions, UV index is higher than 9, like today in our area it was 13.3. Sensitive and untanned skin may burn in less than 15 minutes. Well, what do you think it does at a 13.3? Do you know I already know? Your skin doesn't know what to do. You neither burn nor tan. No. Not above 13, you don't. Actually, high 12s. Your skin does not even know what to do. You just learned something very important there. And it's taken me a year to figure that out. And I have. Moving on. UV radiation will affect human health through, for example, sunburn, snow blindness, and other eye damage, early aging of the skin, and rising rates of skin cancer. It may also cause suppression of the immune response system. It will likewise affect the productivity of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. True. Single-celled algae, chlorophyll, and plant hormones are especially sensitive to UV radiation. True. As the ozone layer is reduced, the Earth's surface is exposed to more 
of the shorter UV wavelengths of the sun's radiation that damage living things. One more time, as the ozone layer is reduced, the Earth's surface is exposed to more of the shorter UV wavelengths of the sun's radiation that damage living things. For each 10% depletion of the ozone layer, we can expect 20% more radiation in these damaging wavelengths. Here it talks about ozone depleting gases, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, we all know about that, and their uh, negative effects on the ozone. Let's jump to ecological effects. Impact on the oceans. This is where it's going to get interesting. Increasing amounts of UV radiation will have an impact on plankton and other tiny organisms at the base of the marine food web. These organisms provide the original food source for all other living organisms in the ocean. Plankton, phytoplankton, as well as zooplankton are highly sensitive to UV radiation as they lack the protective UV abs UVB absorbing layers that higher forms of plants and animals have. Phyto equals plant, zoo equals animal. More UVB radiation reduces the amount of food phytoplankton create through photosynthesis. Zooplankton feeding off of the phytoplankton are also affected. UVB also damages small fish, shrimp, and crab larvae. It has been estimated that on shallow coastal shelves, a 16% reduction of the ozone layer would kill more than 50% of, for instance, anchovy larvae and, a, and cause a 5% drop in plankton numbers and a 6-9% drop in fish yield. Global warming. Ozone layer depletion seems likely to increase the rate of greenhouse warming by reducing the effectiveness of carbon dioxide sink in the oceans. Phytoplankton in the oceans assimilate large amounts of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Increased UV radiation will reduce phytoplankton activity significantly. This means that large amounts of carbon dioxide will remain in the atmosphere. A 10% decrease in carbon dioxide uptake by the oceans, one more time, a 10% decrease in carbon dioxide uptake by the oceans would leave about the same amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as if it was produced by fossil fuel burning. So you see that right there tells you that that mechanism involving the ocean doesn't involve you from burning fossil fuels. Impact on land plants. A high increase in UV radiation may disrupt many ecosystems on land. Rice production may be drastically reduced by the effects of UVB on the nitrogen assimilating activities of microorganisms. With a diminishing ozone layer, it is likely that the supply of natural nitrogen to ecosystems such as tropical rice paddies will be significantly reduced. Most plants and trees grow more slowly and become smaller and more stunted as adult plants when exposed to large amounts of UVB. Increased UVB inhibits pollen germination. Increased effects on air pollution. UVB stimulates the formation of reactive radicals, molecules that react rapidly with other chemicals forming new substances. The hydroxyl radicals, for example, stimulate the creation of tropospheric ozone and harmful and other harmful pollutants. Smog formation creates other oxidized organic chemicals such as formaldehydes. These molecules can also produce reactive hydrogen radicals when they absorb UVB. In urban areas, a 10% reduction of the ozone layer is likely to result in a 10 to 25 percent increase in tropospheric ozone. More UVB radiation seems likely to cause global increases in atmospheric hydrogen peroxide. This is the principal chemical that oxidizes sulfur dioxide to form sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid, in cloud water, 
making it an important part of acid rain formation. Damage to materials. UV radiation causes many materials to degrade more rapidly. Plastic materials used outdoors will have much shorter lifetimes with small increases of UV radiation. PVC sidings, window and door frames, pipes, gutters, etc. Uh, used in buildings degrade faster. Um, ultraviolet radiation definitions. Read this real quick. And then we're going to move on to oceans losing oxygen. UVA radiation, emitted at wavelengths of 315 to 400 nanometers, is unaffected by the ozone and is not harmful or not as harmful as UVB. UVB radiation emitted at 280 to 315 nanometers is affected by decreases in atmospheric ozone. It is UVB that causes most of the damage to plants and animals. UVB damage depends on the amount of atmospheric ozone that can act as a filter, the angle of the sun in the sky, and cloud cover, which shields the surface from some of the ultraviolet radiation. The ozone layer is usually thinnest at the tropics and thickest towards the poles. As stratospheric ozone dimin er, diminishes, proportionately, more of the ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth's surface will arrive in the shorter UVB wavelengths. So more UVB is reaching the surface. UVC radiation, which is lethal, is emitted at wavelengths of 200 to 280 nanometers. Fortunately, UVC is completely absorbed by atmospheric ozone and oxygen. Even with severe ozone reduction, UVC radiation would still be absorbed by the remaining ozone in the atmosphere. I want to jump to phytoplankton real quick, real quick and then we're going to move on. Phytoplankton are algae, microscopic single-celled plants that float in the surface waters of the sea, lakes, and rivers. In the ocean, they constitute the base of, marine, of the marine food web. They have been called the pasture of the sea. Similar to plants on land, they use sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugars and oxygen in the process of photosynthesis. One more time, they have been called the pasture of the sea. Similar to plants on land, they use sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugars and oxygen in the process of photosynthesis. So if they're not doing it, they're not producing oxygen, right? Right. Phytoplankton are tiny and cannot usually be seen individually without a microscope. They range in size from around uh, one one thousandth of a millimeter to about one tenth of a millimeter. However, what they lack in size, they make up for in number. Their concentration is typically around a million cells per liter, but this can rise to tens of millions of cells per liter. Around 200 different species of phytoplankton are found in Antarctic waters. Our research program on phytoplankton in the Southern Ocean is directed to finding out their importance in the diet of small animals, including krill, and their role in global carbon cycle, and the impact on them in, of increased ultraviolet radiation caused by the Antarctic ozone hole. And they talk about, there's another article in here that talks about dead trees. And most of you watching this video are familiar with dead trees around the world. That is a big, big deal. Well, there was a starfish, massive starfish die-off up on the Pacific Northwest a couple of years ago, and there's been more than one around the world. In fact, there's been many ocean creature die-offs over the past few years. And what it's boiling down to, guys, is this. It's time to get busy and figure this out. The fate of Earth, what's going on, what is really going on with our planet. And we all know without the oceans, there's not going to be too much happening around here. The oceans die, the party's over. So we've got to figure out what the problem is and we've got to fix it. Oceans are losing oxygen and becoming more hostile to life, period. Low oxygen areas are expanding in deep waters, killing some creatures outright and changing how and where others live. It may get much worse. Marlin and sailfish are the ocean's perfect athletes, the Michael Jordans of the sea. A marlin can outweigh a polar bear, leap through the air, 
and traverse the sea from Delaware to Madagascar. Sailfish can outrace nearly every fish in the sea. Marlin can hunt in waters half a mile down, and sailfish often head to deep waters too. Yet more and more places around the world, these predators are sticking near the surface, rarely using their formidable power to plunge into the depths to chase prey. The discovery of this behavioral quirk in fish built for diving offers some of the most tangible evidence of a disturbing trend. Warming temperatures are sucking oxygen out of waters, even far out at sea, making enormous stretches of deep ocean hostile to marine life. 200 meters down, there is a freight train of low oxygen water barreling towards the surface says William Gilley, a marine biologist with Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station in Pacific Grove, California. Yet, with all of the ballyhoo about ocean issues, this one hasn't gotten much attention. These are not coastal dead zones, like the ones that sprawl sprawls across the Gulf of Mexico, but great swaths of deep water that can reach thousands of miles offshore. Already naturally low in oxygen, these regions keep growing, spreading horizontally and vertically. Included are vast portions of the eastern Pacific, almost all of Bengal Bay, and an area um, of the Atlantic off of West Africa as broad as the United States. Globally, these low oxygen areas have expanded by more than 1.7 million square miles. 4.5 million square kilometers in the past 50 years. This phenomenon could transfer the seas as much as global warming or ocean acidification will, rearranging where and what creatures eat and altering which species live or die. It already is starting to scramble ocean food chains, that or food chains, that's not good, and threatens to compound almost every other problem in the sea. Scientists are now debating how much oxygen loss is spurred by global warming and how much is driven by natural cycles. But they agree that climate change will make the losses spread and per or perhaps even accelerate. It's UV. It is the UV, guys. I don't think the people realize this is happening right now. No, 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 I agree. Most people don't, says Lisa Levin. And most people aren't aware of the amplified UV. If there is a, everything's frequencies, everything. Your body is a unique frequency. I've told you before, you are a, you're a biological antenna. You have a frequency. You can, you resonate with people and, 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 and matter. You have a frequency. Everything does. Well, if the UVB frequency is changing, it's going to change everything it comes in contact with including the oceans. Lisa Levin goes on to say, I don't think people realize this is happening right now. An ocean expert with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego. Bad water rising. Few understand marlin and sailfish better than biologist Eric Prince. He has studied them in Jamaica, Brazil, the Ivory Coast, and Ghana. He has examined their ear bones in Bermuda, taken uh, tissue samples in Panama and gathered their heads with bayonet like bills still attached during fishing contests in Puerto Rico. One day, a decade ago, while tracking satellite tags attached to these fish, Prince saw something bizarre. Marlin off North Carolina fed in waters as deep as 2,600 feet. But Marlin off Guatemala and Costa Rica hovered high in the water, almost never descending beyond a few hundred feet. Sailfish follow the same pattern. These billfish have special tissues in their heads that keep their brains warm in deep water. So why were they bunching up at the ocean's surface? He was very puzzled. The culprit, it turned out, was a gigantic pool of low oxygen water deep off of Central America. These fish were staying up high trying to avoid suffocating below. Do you think maybe that could be part of the problem with the Great Barrier Reef? Prince's discovery came just as other scientists were figuring out that rising temperatures were expanding natural low oxygen zones in the deep ocean, pushing them skyward by as much as a meter, three feet per year. 
Over the next 10 years, researchers figured out that this change already was driving marine creatures, sailfish, sharks, tuna, swordfish, and Pacific cod, as well as the smaller sardines, herring, shad, and mackerel they eat into ever narrower bands of oxygen-rich water near the surface. It leaves just a very thin lens on the top of the ocean where most organisms can live, says Sarah Moffitt of the Bodega Marine Laboratory at the University of California, Davis. Congregating alongside their prey appears to be making some bigger fish fatter as they burn less energy hunting, but living in such compressed living in such a compressed area also may be speeding the decline of top predators such as tuna, sailfish, and marlin by making them more accessible to fishing fleets. It makes the predators much more likely to be caught by the longline fleet, says Prince of the uh, National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration Southeast Fisheries Science Center in Florida. Very slightly, every year, they become more and more susceptible to overfishing. That's true. Oxygen is so central to life, even the marine world, that its loss is harming animals in countless other ways, too. Warming waters deplete oxygen. Fish, squid, octopus, and crab all draw dissolved oxygen from the water. And just as oxygen levels shift with elevation, oxygen at sea varies with depth. But in the ocean, oxygen is also dynamic, changing daily and seasonally with weather and tides, or over years with cycles of warming and cooling. Oxygen gets into the sea in two ways through photosynthesis, which takes place only near the top where the light penetrates, or through the mixing of air and water at the surface by wind and waves. Deep ocean waters hold far less oxygen than the surface waters because they haven't been in contact with the air for centuries. And in many places, decomposing organic matter raining down from the surface uses up what little oxygen remains. The natural deep water oxygen minimum zones cover great swaths of the ocean's interior. They are far different from hypoxic coastal dead zones, which are multiplying too, with more than 400 now reported worldwide. Dead zones are caused by nitrogen and other nutrients as rivers and storms flush pollution from farms and cities into nearshore waters. The expansion of Deep sea low oxygen zones, on the other hand, is driven by temperature. Warm water carries less dissolved oxygen. It's also lighter than cold water. That leaves the ocean segregated in layers, restricting delivery of fresh oxygen to the deep and making the oxygen poor zones much bigger. Breathless seas. Oxygen is an essential for life in the sea as it is on land. Oxygen levels normally vary with depth and goes on to talk about how it varies with the depth but there's some sort of weird oh here we go oxygen uh, levels normally vary with depth but deep oceans are already low in oxygen are losing more as seas warm wreaking havoc on marine life here are four elements that change ocean mixing chemistry shoaling and the consequences um, the natural thing to expect is that the ocean, or as the ocean gets warmer, circulation will slow down and gets more sluggish, and the waters going into the deep ocean will hang around longer, says Curtis Dutch, a chemical oce oceanography professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And indeed, oxygen seems to be declining. The zone off West Africa that is as big as the United States has grown by 15% since 1960 and 10% since 1995. At 650 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean off of Southern California, oxygen has dropped 30% in some places in a quarter century. Many scientists already suspect global warming is partly to blame for this transformation. I personally think part of the problem is UV. Dutch and others, however, think oxygen declines so far have been driven by complicated natural factors. Ocean conditions vary 
so much normally that they might be experiencing a unusual period of depletion, one that could moderate soon. But Deutsch called that very, very, a very, very thin silver lining. Right now in the ocean, there is credibil credibility, strong internal variability, and a very thin climate trend on top of it, he says. But my sense from all of the model simulations we've done is that we're on the verge of having that trend emerge from the noise. Some species, such as Dover sole, may, have, may be unaffected, but many areas could be left with far fewer, higher life forms. Most researchers, most researchers project that oxygen loss will keep driving many species towards the surface, reducing habitat for some, and concentrating prey for birds, turtles, and other surface predators. Winds in some regions will draw the oxygen depleted waters to the surface and push it to shallower continental shelves. When oxygen drops there, some sensitive species that can't move die. Even survivors experience stress, which can make them vulnerable to predators, disease, and overfishing. This has already begun. The waters of the north or of the Pacific Northwest, where we talked about that starfish die off of a few years ago, starting in 2002, intermittently gotten so low in oxygen that at times they've smothered sea cucumbers, sea stars, uh, crabs. This biologically rich, where winds draw waters from the deep 50 miles offshore and push them to the beach, is temporarily transformed into a lifeless wasteland. That's what I was talking about earlier, about the uh, massive starfish die-off. Now they know that the Pacific Northwest out there becomes a lifeless wasteland at times because of low oxygen. Those starfish died of suffocation. I look at it as a major reshaping of the ecosystem, says Jack Barth, a chemical oceanographer at Oregon State University in Corvallis. Localized die-offs aren't even the most disruptive effect of depleted oxygen. Changes in oxygen turn out to be really important in determining where organisms are and what they do, says marine biologist Francis Chan, also of Oregon State University. The fate of some odd little fish suggests the consequences can be enormous. Could be the fate of Earth. The food chain breaks down. Anyway, into the light. Since the 1950s, researchers every year have dropped nets a thousand feet down to catalog marine life many miles off California's coast. Most track commercially imported species caught by the fishing industry. But J. Anthony Coslow tallies fish often credited with keeping marine systems functioning soundly. Tiny midwater bristlemouths, the, reason, the region's most abundant marine species, as well as viperfish, hatchetfish, razormouth dragonfish, and even minnow-like lampfish. All are significant parts of the seafood buffet that supports the life in the eastern Pacific, and all are declining dramatically with the vertical rise of low oxygen water. If it was a 10% change, it wouldn't be a big deal. But they've declined by 63%, says Coslow, of the Scripps Institution of Oceanog Oceanography. And what's been amazing is it's across the board. Eight major groups of deep sea fishes declining together, and it's strongly correlated with declining oxygen. Warm water loses oxygen. Did you know that when you you, let's say, make a cup of hot tea. If you boil the water, you're taking out the oxygen. Make a pot of coffee, you're taking out the oxygen. Don't you think that the, the you know how the UV light feels on your skin during the day? It, it feels uncomfortable. It feels intense. You can set something out there in the direct sunlight. doesn't have anything to do with the temperature. We've proven that with the, the UV instruments. I've showed you that the UV can be up above 12 and the temperature can be pretty comfortable. But you can set a uh, take, you could set a coffee cup out there or something made of aluminum or iron, set it in the direct sunlight, in the direct UV, and touch it, and it's hot. It's very hot. Your arm feels hot. Your shirt feels hot. 
Don't you think that the water is going to feel hot? Even though the temperature may only be 80 degrees, the UV is going to make it feel more intense. It's the UV, guys, that's taking the oxygen out of the water. It's making the oceans a deeper blue color. We don't want the skies to get deeper blue in color because that means there's a lower ozone layer up there, less oxygen in the ozone. So that's not good. And I'll finish on something here in just a minute. Let me finish this article. Uh, most of these fish spend their days swimming hundreds of feet down, just above low oxygen water. Many are black camouflaged by the dark, deep waters where the light never reaches. They rise at night to feed on plankton. Coslow can say precisely why these fish populations have collapsed, but he suspects they, too, now spend more time closer to the surface seeking oxygen. That puts these fish during the day in a region where light penetrates, making them easier pickings for birds, marine mammals, rockfish, and other sight feeders. If that's the case, Coslow says, the ramifications would be huge. And what he's implying is it's going to break down the food chain. Such tiny fish are a massive food source around the world. Globally, they account for uh, far more mass in the sea than the entire world's catch of fish combined. But there isn't enough historical data in other parts of the world to determine if the trend is unique to just California. They are central to the ecology of the world's oceans, Coslow says. Scientists suspect these fish already may be partly responsible for at least one surprising change a massive northward expansion between 1997 and 2010, I actually remember this, of the northern Pacific Ocean's most ravenous visitor, the Humboldt squid. I remember this. Uh, there was a piece came out in 2010 about this. Once found from South America to uh, Mexico, um, they used to hang just above the equator, with occasional forays into California, the Humboldt squid has moved so far north that in recent years it has been seen off the coast of Alaska. Researchers tested squid in tanks and found low oxygen was hard on them. Uh, hard on them, too, even though the jumbo squid could slow its metabolism. Yet, here they were, faring so well at the edge of low oxygen areas that they'd become a master predator of midwater fish. These squid are out-competing all of the tunas and sharks and marine mammals that may want to feed in this zone, Stanford Gillies says. Researchers did not directly connect the expansion of the squid's feeding area to poor oxygen, but Coslow linked low oxygen water shifts in the midwater fish on the squid's menu may have prompted them to move farther north. I think there might be a sweet spot for Humboldt squid, where low oxygen... Food and light are in perfect balance, and that's accounting for their expansion, actually. Still, the squid's expansion was not subtle. Tracking uh, its causes almost certainly is simpler than unspooling other impacts. And oxygen loss exacerbates other issues. Marine creatures need more oxygen in warmer waters. For example, climate change means they increasingly will have less. There's a Humboldt squid right there. I think we are changing the world. I just don't think the response are going to be as predictable as we uh, think, says Francisco Chavez, senior scientist with California's Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I think there are a slew of surprises ahead and how low oxygen areas will affect everything else depends on how much they spread. Looking back to see ahead. I want you to pay real close attention here. If you've hung out for 44 minutes, listen to this. Looking back in time to see ahead. To answer the question, scientists recently examined marine sediment cores from a period of glacial melt 17,000 to 11,000 years ago. During that time, global average air temperatures rose 3 to 4 degrees Celsius the closest historical analog for the projected future, says study co-author Teresa Hill of Bodega Marine Laboratory. One more time. During that time, global average air temperatures rose 3 to 4 degrees Celsius 17,000 to 11,000 years ago. Were they driving big SUVs?
Were they polluting the atmosphere 17,000 years ago to cause global warming? Probably not. I don't think there were any Cadillacs back then. 747 airplanes. Coal mines. But the temperature still rose 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. Why? I think they just pretty much told us right there that humans aren't the problem. It's silical. The temperature rises on a silical cycle. But anyway, that's just how I take it. During that time, global average air temperatures rose 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. The closest historical analog, analog for the projected future. Um, the idea here is let's take an interval with somewhat analogous warming and see how low oxygen zones responded. The results, or the results, low oxygen areas exploded around the world. So what they did, they took that data that they got from 17,000 to 11,000 years ago. There was a global rise, global warming back then too, and the result was low oxygen areas around the world. So, looks like we're headed for the same thing again. What we found is that their expansion was just, ex ex uh, just extremely large and abrupt, says lead author Moffat. Their footprint across ocean basins grew much more than we had anticipated. One low oxygen region off of Chile and Peru combined with two countries now have an anchovy fleet that makes up the world's largest single species fishery. Was much larger than thousands of years ago. It stretched from 9,800 feet deep to within 490 feet off the surface. And off of California, low oxygen waters came far closer to the surface than they do today. Their research showed that environments we might think of as stable, like the deep ocean, may not be so stable at all, Moffat says. In the blink of an eye, geologically speaking, entire ocean basins changed. And many scientists suspect they are doing so once again at a cost they can't yet quantify. Article from the National Geographic dated two years ago. And I'm sure they know more now today. But we went back in time a little bit and learned a little bit about what was going on a few years ago and took what we know today taken the studies that we've done with UV and I do think it is a silical pattern that is basically suffocating sea creatures from lack of oxygen in the water when there's low oxygen in the water uh, if it's anything like low oxygen in the sky it does turn a deeper blue we did read that just a few minutes ago ozone is oxygen with simply an extra atom so you have oxygen in the atmosphere that is responsible for filtering harmful ultraviolet radiation, UVA, UVB, and UVC, if the oxygen in the atmosphere is depleting and the oxygen in the ocean or the oceans around the world are depleting, doesn't that sound an alarm doesn't that kind of connect a dot that it's the uv it does to me i think so because back 17,000 years ago they weren't burning hydrocarbons they weren't driving big suvs they weren't burning coal factories they didn't have an industrial age i'm not quite sure what they did but that's what we're being told today, that we are the ones causing global warming. Well, what caused it back then? Rose three to four degrees Celsius. I think it was something to do with the sun and the UV and the, and the, and the atmosphere itself. It's a silical situation where the ozone, for whatever reasons, goes through a silical pattern to where it weakens and strengthens. 
So you basically got ozone slash oxygen up in the atmosphere that is responsible for filtering the UV. And the oxygen, ozone, is depleting, just like it is in the oceans. And what happens when it depletes? It turns darker blue. What happens to a human being when they turn blue? We're connected to all of this. The ocean, the sky, the earth. This is where we're, we're born of this. We're part of this whole thing. And you coincidentally too turn blue when you have lack of oxygen. Just like the sky and just like the ocean. It's my humble opinion that it's definitely the UV light. The UV light is amplified and we're told it's not. We are proving that it's higher than what we're being told. And there's a reason for that. I'm just looking out for humanity and my fellow human passengers on Spaceship Earth. We have a right to know. And we're going to try. Got a guy now in Oregon, Luis. That's where you got these readings today. You got mine from uh, out here in Southeast Phoenix. And we've got Richard out on the East Coast of Florida. So we've got a small network of UVers. We're reading the UVs on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're going to try to do them at the same time each day. Got Luis's today. Mine was a 13.3. Couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was actually shocked because it was cloudy. But the sea creatures are, are suffocating. And I think that's what's happening with... Uh, the uh, Great Barrier Reef suffocating side effect from the UV. So I found this very informative. I don't think a lot of people realize that a lot of these mass fish die-offs and jellyfish die-offs and starfish die-offs, especially this one up here, up in the Pacific Northwest. At first they said it was a uh, uh, unrelated. It wasn't related to low oxygen. They weren't even onto the low oxygen thing yet, at least with the starfish. Now they've admitted it is a low oxygen, like a lot of other creatures. So if the food chain breaks down in the sea, then eventually it will come to land. And then that would be the demise of, of life on Earth. If the oxygen goes, every living thing on Earth goes. And right now it's struggling. It's struggling and it's not really well known. Me personally, I don't have any doubts. I think it's from the UV. I think the UV gets so intense at certain times, and maybe it's every 12, 13,000 years. Something causes the sun to put out a different frequency, a more intense UV that weakens the ozone. That can, because of the oceans, replenish. But during these times of something, and I do believe it is something in space, weakens the atmosphere. It passes, and then it comes back again thousands of years later. But I do think that is what happens, and I do think that it originates from space. So that's my video, guys. That's my thoughts on, on this. I hope I've taught you something about maybe the at least the UV. Maybe you didn't know about the oceans and, and uh, they're depleting oxygen at a pretty alarming rate, actually. And um, the UVA, UVB, UVC. UVA is what basically delivers vitamin D. UVB, sunburn, suntan. And if you're not getting a sunburn or a suntan, then chances are the UV uh, B is up over 13. And then I honestly don't know what to tell you because uh, I don't know. That's new territory. <laughs> but I do know what happens. I know two people that were at a park one day and I measured and the UV was 12.8. I told them to go home if they didn't have an umbrella or get in the shade. And they were like, oh no, we've been out here for about an hour. We haven't even burned. And they were in the direct sunlight. And the UV was over 12.8. And they were out in the direct sunlight when it was over 12.8 for an hour. They didn't burn and they didn't tan. So, there you have it, guys. 
I appreciate you watching and sticking around for almost a full hour. I hope it was informative and we're going to stick to our UV readings. Today was a record for me, 13.33 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, May 7th. And we're not even at summer yet. But we've learned that temperature doesn't have anything to do with UV. The temperature today was 72 degrees and it was cloudy. I just happened to go out and catch a breach where the, the clouds were gapped and the sun was coming through. And it was 13.33 at 1 o'clock. Temperature was 72 degrees. Protect yourself and protect those you love. Thanks for watching.